morning and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter and it is 5.30 a.m. here in Mexico where I'm at, where I am sadly coming in for uh, my second to last day. This is my last full day, so I'm, I'm tuning in here with a heavy heart and just uh, praying that seeing you guys this morning will encourage me, inspire me, and lift me back up. So good morning. Come on in. As you guys enter in, uh, let me know where you are and what time it is where you guys are, are watching. And if you guys are on the replay or the podcast, I love you guys. I honor you. And uh, I look forward to just seeing what God does in the time that we get to spend together. Thank you, Jesus. There we go. Thank you, Sister May. We got brothers and sisters from all around the world. Uh, Paris, France, Los Angeles, Houston, Texas, Sydney, Australia, uh, LA. Yeah, yeah. When am I bringing coffee and prayer back? This is coffee and prayer. I don't know what that question means. Uh, Aloha from Atlanta, Hawaii. Uh, good, good morning from Germany, India, Sydney, Australia. Man, my Aussie showed up big time. We got the Mitchells from Gilroy, California at 3.30 in the morning. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love to see it. Brother Christian's here. He says replay is not the same. No, it is not. No, it is not. Yeah, coffee and prayer is here. It hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, you know, we, we've been here. So glory to God. Check it out. Today, we are finishing the book of Philippians. So maybe you're new here um, and, and you're kind of like, what is this? What's going on? Uh, well, I'm a pastor in Inglewood, California, and my wife and I run a ministry. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to get up every morning about 4.30 and drink a little bit of coffee and pray and read my word. And um, we started back in October. We've been doing this for over six months where we get up every morning without missing. We haven't missed one day. And uh, we've read one chapter from the New Testament and one chapter from the Old Testament. Like when we say it, when I say it out loud, it's... Uh, it's kind of cool, like glory to God, it's pretty cool. Uh, for six months, for half of the year, we've gotten up and we've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. We've read Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We've read uh, Ephesians, um, Galatians, excuse me, Galatians, Ephesians, and now here we are in uh, the book of Philippians. And we're gonna start Colossians tomorrow. The cool thing is that at the end of each chapter, we do a digital altar call. And so we just did one earlier in the week. I'm pretty sure it was Monday. I think we kicked the week off Monday. It was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, so Monday, and like 16 people got saved. We're gonna do it again today. We're gonna give you a chance. Maybe you don't know Jesus or you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior. We'll give you a chance at the very end to do so. Um, glory to God. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So. I want to pray before we get started. And listen, I've got a little bit of bad news. Uh, I do want to share that with you guys before we pray. Maybe you guys can pray for me. But this morning, I, uh, I did not have the opportunity to get coffee. So I think that today is probably um, the first day that I this is not coffee and prayer for me. Um, I have juice. So I've got water and I've got juice packets um, inside of them. My coffee machine wasn't working this morning and I didn't want to make a ton of noise leaving to wake up Kyra trying to flip the thing upside down and fix it. And so your boy's drinking, oh no, I guess I didn't do coffee during the Daniel fast, Never mind. But yeah, it's water and prayer. So be praying for me. As soon as we're done here, I gotta find a, a, cap, a cup of cafe, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and the second thing is, is that tomorrow I'll be doing it, but uh, we fly out really early in the morning. So we're actually being picked up from our hotel at 5 a.m. So I'm gonna hop on and do an early coffee and prayer again tomorrow at 4.30 a.m. my time. And I'll do a quick 30 minute, uh, a quick 30 minute coffee and prayer tomorrow. I'm not going to miss the day. I just got to adjust to my schedule. So you guys will definitely have to watch the replay tomorrow. Um, and so that answers the question. Somebody asked, do we do this on weekends? We have done this 180 days in a row on holidays, on weekends, on birthdays, on, uh, you know, we, we haven't missed 180 days, including the weekends. So, um, yeah, glory to God. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for gathering us here in this place. Lord, we're here ready to receive. We ask that you would change us, that you would transform us, that you would speak to us through your scripture, that we want to leave this place different. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would prepare hearts, the individuals who are here who might not know you, who are curious about you, that you would open their hearts and uh, give them, put them in a position to receive your Holy Spirit. 
and to put their faith in you with a repentant heart, God. We want people to leave here knowing you. Uh, we understand that there is a sense of urgency. We understand that uh, people are in desperate need for your truth. People are in desperate need for your salvation, God. And so as we, as we enter in, um, as we draw near, we know that you are drawing near to us. As we knock, we know that doors are being opened. God, as we uh, seek, we know that we will find you in this place. And so, Lord, uh, we just ask that you would tear down any distractions, anything that pulls at people's attention, uh, anything that people are getting hung up on uh, or, or, or thinking, overthinking about, Lord, that you would tear down those strongholds in the spiritual realm. Uh, your grace and your mercy would abound in this place and that people would be uh, attentive and ready to receive your truth. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So check it out, man. Philippians chapter 4, as we closed chapter 3, you know, we were just talking about continuing toward the goal, right? Understanding that um, <clears throat> individuals who are living according to the ways of this world are prideful. They have no shame in their game. Evidence of the Holy Spirit dwelling within you means that if you make a mistake, if you mess up, uh, there, there's that. There's that conviction, right? That is that frustration with yourself. Maybe even it comes with discouragement. I'm not saying that's from the spirit, but uh, many people will sin. They'll choose sin. They won't fall or stumble into sin. And when they choose that sin because the Holy Spirit dwells within them, they find themselves frustrated or agitated or irritated or there's guilt or shame that's attached. Again, not from the spirit. It's from our own uh, it's from our own lack of self-control and that's evidence right then and there of the spirit because if you don't have the holy spirit you don't care about that stuff right before i had the holy spirit i lived however i wanted i did whatever i wanted and there was no consciousness to the sin does that make sense as i lived in sin without the holy spirit dwelling in me i did what i want i said what i want i treated people how i wanted to do i did whatever it is that i wanted and there was no conviction there was no sense of right or wrong. It says in verse 19, this is chapter three, I'm recapping, so please don't get lost, follow me. It, it said in the end, they will be destroyed. They do whatever their bodies want. They are proud of their shameful acts and they think only about earthly things. All right, so that's kind of how we closed with Philippians chapter three. Um, let me see here, I need to make, uh, I wanna make sure, I'm gonna drop my boy in as a, as a moderator real quick. My guy is up early and up and at him. I love it. <laughs> I have a great tan. Trust me, I've been spending a lot of time in the sun. Thank you for that. In Philippians 4, this probably has uh, some of the most quoted scripture. And it has some of, uh, some of my favorite scriptures that I quote often, which is Philippians 4, 8. <clears throat> but we jump in. And first he does his, you know, his introductions. My dear brothers and sisters, I love you and want to see you. You bring me joy and make me proud of you. So stand strong in the Lord as I have told you. All right, jumping forward, verse four, okay? Verse four, it says, be full of joy in the Lord always. I will say again, be full of joy. This is something that we spoke about briefly yesterday. Um, joy and happiness is a choice, right? Understand that joy and happiness is a choice. It's a decision that you make regardless of your circumstances, regardless of what you're going through and uh, regardless of the chaos that's circling around you, you choose how you respond. You choose your position, your heart posture. You choose what you focus on, the good or the bad. And, and here come the, the stream of, oh, easier said than done, right? The self-defeating thoughts and ideas right now as I'm saying to be joyous in all things there's these self-defeating thoughts and whispers that are coming in right now and they're telling you oh that's easier said than done I wish it was that easy right these whispers aren't whispers from the Lord these whispers are self-defeating thoughts and they're also uh, they're, they're excuses that allow you to continue to idolize your suffering and to keep you stuck in the very place that you're at right so as you read this scripture, when you hear that, be full of joy in the Lord always, I will say again, be full of joy. And when I encourage you and inspire you right now, regardless of what you're going through, that you need to choose joy. As you are reading the scripture, which is the truth, the enemy sneaks up right next to you and starts to whisper those sweet nothings in your ear. Amen.
Do you guys understand that? So when you start to question and you start to go, oh, easier said than done. Oh, it, you know, oh, I wish that I could do that. When you start to hear those things right here, right? The audacity that the enemy has in a Bible study, when the group of believers are coming together and we're going over scripture and truth, he has the audacity to pull up a seat and start whispering those things to you right in the middle of your Bible study. And this is a place right here. This is a place where you are to rebuke the enemy. This is a place where, where you are to stand firm. As you resist the devil, he will flee from you. So in this moment, as, as I'm encouraging you to be full of joy, regardless of your circumstances, be full of joy, regardless of what you're going through, be full of joy in the face of adversity, obstacles, issues, trials, and tribulations. As I'm admonishing you and encouraging you and, 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 and I'm, I'm telling you, hey, this is a position, a heart posture that we can all take regardless of what we're going through. The enemy tries to attack. He tries to steal your truth. He tries to take away this firm foundation that you have to stand on. It says that uh, in verse five, or in verse four, it says, always, I will say again, be full of joy. It's a beautiful thing, right? And if we can just take a moment right now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit on this verse for just a moment. Why are we joyous, okay? We're not joyous when somebody dies. We're not joyous when we make a mistake or we fail. We're not joyous in those things. But where do we derive our joy from? Our joy should come from the fact that we have the divine revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And there are people in this world, around this world, who do not know him. So we have the, what brings us joy in the middle of chaos. What brings us joy is that if I were to die today, if I stepped outside here and was hit by a car, if I died today, okay, I have the, the faith and the trust that I know where I'm going. And the very fact that I know Christ gives me the peace, the comfort, and the joy that I need to live my life regardless, right, regardless of my circumstances in a manner that brings glory and honor to him. And, and, and when I share that, it is easier said than done because what happens is we consider our own suffering greater than the suffering of Christ. We, we elevate and exalt the things that we're going through to a place that uh, makes us feel like the world is revolving around us. Maybe like nobody understands, like nobody else is going through it as if we're the very first human beings walking this earth and the only ones who are experiencing hate or experiencing issues in our family. We're the only one who's ever been touched wrong. We're the only person who's been taken advantage of. We're the only person that's been cheated. We're the only person that's been stabbed in the back. We're the only person that was born into this dysfunctional family. We start to elevate our own suffering and start thinking that we're, our situations are so unique uh, that, that God can't fix us or God doesn't love us or God doesn't care about us because we're not getting what we want when we want it. We uh, create these, these selfish attitudes and, and really get things out of order. Right? We'll get these things out of order. Vicki said it. We'll never have as many scars on our body as Christ did. Our suffering will never supersede or surpass the suffering that Christ went through. And when we can get to a place where we remind ourselves that the suffering of Christ outweighs our suffering, we can get to a place where we can see joy and find joy and peace and, and, and happiness in every situation at all times, regardless of what's going on. Because we understand this is not our final destination. This is a dress rehearsal. This is a place that we are, we are passing through. We are in this world, but not of this world. We have been dropped off here, and it, we are being a Christian does not mean you're immune to the issues and the obstacles of life, right? So we tend to we tend to exalt our own suffering, and we start to make excuses of why we cannot be joyous in all circumstances. And to me, okay, this is maybe going out on a ledge, but that is an act of disobedience, right? we're called to be joyous, if we're called to endure, if we're called to be of a good countenance, if we're called to not, you know, to not be constantly discouraged and filled with worry and anxiousness, yet we allow ourselves, which is a choice we're choosing to, we're choosing to sit with the enemy and allow the whispers of, or allow his whispers to dictate our emotions and feelings. It's an act of disobedience. We're called to be full of joy always. In verse six, it says, do not worry about anything, okay? But pray and ask God for everything you need. There's a big emphasis in Philippians four about need. 
it constantly is talking about the word need uh, because many of us have what we need but, but we're, we're, we're frustrated and discouraged because we don't have what we want. Mm, that's a tweet, right? Really think on that for just a moment. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you on that. Many of us have everything that we truly need, okay? You have what you need to live and survive the next 24 hours where you're frustrated and where you're discouraged and you're upset is you don't have the things that you want. Think about that. Huh. So it says, don't worry about anything. And it goes back, even in the Gospels, he talks about the lilies of the field. He talks about the sparrows in the air. Uh, he talks about how they have everything that they need. They have everything. They have the water, the air to breathe, the food they're taken care of. They're clothed in beauty. And, and then it's like, aren't we worth more than two sparrows? Aren't we worth more than birds? We, we're... We are creations that were created in God's image. He cares about each of us. And he, you have all of the things that you truly need. But he says, don't worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need, always giving thanks. So here we've been told to always be filled with joy and to always be thankful, always be thankful. Even in the middle of trial, tribulation, circumstance, even in the middle of obstacles and issues, even in the middle of things that aren't personal, you know, aren't, aren't going your way. To be thankful, to be filled with joy. How many of us can truly say that that's how we're walking around here? I preached on Easter Sunday and I said, I, I told you this before, I'm, I'm scared to ask how people are doing these days. Not for a lack of empathy or care, but it's, you, it's almost an automatic response. Hey, how you doing? <sighs> well, you know, I've been struggling, fill in the blank. <sighs> well, you know, I've just been stuck, you know, and it's just like, okay, where's the joy? Where's the victory? Where's the gratitude? Now, that doesn't mean that I don't want you to be honest or open or transparent. That doesn't mean that I don't want you to share with me what you're going through. Please don't put that, those words in my mouth. That's not my heart posture. But it's rare, right? It's rare that you see individuals who are walking in victory and are, are truthfully victorious and truthfully grateful and thankful. But, but you can see it, right? So, so I, I, you know, you might have a friend, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. You can clearly see that things aren't good. And what this tells me is that it's individuals are struggling, discouraged, and, and, and you know, shuffling through life without joy or gratitude, without peace, happiness, or contentment. It tells me that they don't understand who they are. They don't understand how to apply the word to their life. They don't know how to look at life through the lens of the Lord. It tells me that they're allowing the enemy a place and a spot in their life. They're allowing a foothold for the enemy. They're pulling up a seat to the table and they're sitting there and listening to his lies when he needs to be rebuked, when he needs to be resisted, when he needs to be cast out of that place. And too often he has a foothold and he has a place in your life. He has a partnership in your everyday life. It's wild. It, it blows my mind. But it instructs us to not worry about anything, to pray and ask God for everything you need, always giving thanks. And when you do that, when you don't allow worry to be an idol in your life, when you ask for everything that you need, and regardless of whether you have it or not, you're constantly giving thanks, it says God's peace, which is greater than we can comprehend, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, so if you twist that around, right, we're not twisting or manipulating the scripture, but if you actually stop and think about it, how many of you want peace? How many of you are tormented in your thoughts? How many of you are tormented and feel like the enemy is constantly coming against you? How many of you feel that when I say that he's pulled up a seat to the table or he's got a foothold in your life, you're like, yeah, that's me. I constantly hear negativity and self-defeating thoughts. I'm constantly being fed this idea of not being good enough. My past is constantly being brought up to, uh, to shame me or to make me feel bad about myself. If this resonates with you, here is what the key to success is. Right? It says there's peace that, that is greater than we can understand and it will keep our hearts and our mind in Christ Jesus. Well, what do we have to do to receive this peace that, that keeps our hearts and our minds on Jesus? It says, don't worry, pray and ask God for everything you need and always give thanks. Break that down. Think about that. 
So it, this is the key to success. If you read it in reverse, right? God's peace, which is greater than we can understand, it surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you what? Do not worry about anything. Pray. Ask God for everything that you need and always give thanks. Interesting. Interesting. So, so many of us are like, okay, but what else? So, so many times it's that simple. If I'm constantly looking for things to be grateful for in my life, it's hard for me to focus on the things that I don't have. If I'm constantly thankful for the things that I personally have right now, and all of the things that I need, if that's where my focus is on, then I realize that there's no room for lack. There's no room for me to overthink. I stop thinking about what I want and I understand that I have everything that I need. It's a heart posture. It's a perspective. As we switch the, our, our heart posture and our perspective, when we start to look at life through the lens that God looks at it through, we start to see things differently. We no longer focus on our lack or our need, right? I am constantly walking around with this attitude of gratitude. Now, this is something that I practiced far before I ever became a Christian, right? This gratitude mindset. There, there was a, a time in my life where I wasn't following Christ, but I still practiced the, the, the art of being grateful. And there was this time between getting out of prison and, and getting back to the gospel. I was out for about a year, just kind of lost and not really uh, knowing my place. And I definitely wasn't serving God, but I still practiced um, the, the practice of being thankful and grateful. In fact, you know, I was doing minutes of motivation. Um, little fun fact you guys might not know, but before I was doing what I'm doing now, I was still on social media and I would do these minutes of motivation and, and every Thursday was Thankful Thursday and I would go through and encourage people to write down lists of things that they were grateful for and thankful for that they had in their life at the moment and to constantly shift your, your eyes on, on, on being grateful and this came to me, this practice came to me because I lost everything. Before prison, I was so focused on things. I was so focused on material. I was so focused on gathering, uh, you know, financially uh, materialistic things. And I never stopped to really be thankful or grateful for where I was at and the things that I had. And eventually pride got a hold of me and um, I started to exalt myself and worship at my own uh, altar, like the altar of Andrew. I was building Andrew's kingdom and it, I, I lost everything. And so it wasn't until I lost everything that I understood that I had more than I had ever desired or needed in those moments. And had I just shifted my perspective and was thankful and grateful for the things that I had, um, I wouldn't have allowed pride to get the best of me. I wouldn't have been so focused on constantly getting more, right? Uh, constantly uh, achieving, constantly striving. Because I found that no matter how much I earned or how much I achieved or how, whatever accolades or awards that uh, I was able to cross off the list, that it was this constant striving, it was this constant going, and none of them ever satisfied, and I was constantly trying to get more. It was powerful. It's powerful. Uh, moving forward, uh, I've quoted verse 8 probably a dozen times in the last two weeks. Uh, but it says, and again, as far as context goes, we have Paul um, in this place right into the church uh, in Philippi. Um, is the church of the Philippians. And he's encouraging them, saying, brothers and sisters, think about the things that are good and worthy of praise. Think about the things that are true and honorable and right and pure and beautiful and respected. Do what you learned and received from me what I told you and what you saw me do. And the God who gives peace will be with you. So here, uh, again, he's just encouraging us to be thinking on things that are, that are good, that are worthy, that are true. How many of us get caught up on thinking about things that are the opposite of that, right? Many of us get caught up thinking about things that are gossipy. Many times we get caught up thinking about things that are untrue, that, that are unworthy. Many, many times we're so caught up with what's going on, uh, World Star, TMZ, uh, that, that we realize, we don't even realize that we're poisoning our minds, that we're, we're being consumed with entertainment and things that aren't valuable, things that aren't encouraging, things that aren't right. Uh, we're bombarded with news in social media and, and, and things that are constantly going on around the world. Now, I'm not saying that we need to 
like hide ourselves in these little bubbles where we don't have an idea of what's happening in this world. I think that we need to be educated and we need to be aware, but we also need to make sure that we're not allowing our thoughts and our minds to be consumed with things that aren't edifying and encouraging or building us up or pushing us closer to Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Man, no coffee definitely hits different, especially when my body saying, dude, it's about to be four o'clock in the morning, right? So moving forward, um, this is where this big emphasis on, on need starts to happen. I love that Paul says, again, he's speaking to the, 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 the Philippians. He says, I have learned to be satisfied with the things I have and with everything that happens. So uh, two things come from this. You understand that it is learned. He has learned, okay, so it has taken time. There might have been a time when he wasn't satisfied with the things that he had and everything that happened. And I think that that is a part of being spiritually mature. And we understand that spiritually maturing comes from the time that you spend in the presence of God. So again, if you and I get saved at the exact same time and I spend more time in the word and spend more time in God's presence and I spend more time praying and in worship and you spend a little bit more time um, in the world, watching the things of this world, you take, you don't prune some of the things out of your life. You spend more time, uh, you know, still dabbling with the things of this world. I'm going to mature at a quicker rate. So if we came back a year later and I'm watching things and, uh, you know, podcasts, I'm listening to podcasts and watching sermons and I'm spending more time in scripture and I'm reading scripture, uh, Christian books and I'm, I'm spending time in prayer and I'm sitting in his presence, but you're not doing the same thing. If we came back to the same room a year later, one of us are going to be more spiritually mature for the mere fact that I have been feeding my spirit things of the spirit and you have been feeding your flesh things of this world. So spiritual maturity is a very real thing that people don't understand. And the rate at which you mature is dependent upon the effort and energy and time that you spend. So, again, I'm not talking about being saved by your works, but what you do with your life after you're saved, you will have to answer for. And many times people will be saved and they'll have a relationship with God, but they won't want to put in the spiritual work. It's the equivalent of uh, me trying to get in shape without working out. I point because the weight room's right over here. And this whole trip I've been here, I've been working out, man. I've worked out every day, some days twice. I went and swam laps in the pool and I'm not trying to promote myself, but I understand that I have goals. I understand that, um, you know, I uh, there's things that I want to accomplish. I'm going to say this. This is going to sound weird. You guys think I'm crazy, but I haven't had any tacos since I've been here. I haven't had any carbs. I've been eating paleo the entire time, strict paleo. So uh, even though it's vacation, I came here with something, with a mindset that I'm here, I'm resting and recovering, but resting and recovering to me means hydrating, means exercising, which means eating well. Um, for me, I don't wanna leave vacation and have to get a detox. I don't wanna leave vacation and need another vacation. So I come here with uh, my mindset on, I'm gonna do the things that I love to do. I love to exercise, so I'm gonna take advantage of it. I love to drink a lot of water and rest by the pool. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go and explore. I'm gonna do things that really recharge my battery so that when I get back, I'm not like, dude, I need a vacation from that vacation. And many people do that. They'll go off and they'll get hammered and drunk the whole time. They won't exercise and they'll eat whatever they want. And then they come back from vacation sluggish and exhausted, uh, you know, and, and needing a vacation from the very time that they just spent. So I think of vacation in a different way. I share that because my goals and my mindset, I understand if I want to be where I'm going to be, there's going to be sacrifices, right? Who comes to Mexico and doesn't eat tacos? Me. Right? Who comes to Mexico and doesn't drink margaritas and a bunch of sugary drinks? Me. I, I, I come here and, uh, you know, the time, the way that I vacay looks a little different, but I have the discipline and the consistency and I understand that my mind is set on something. And so I want to grow. I'm going regardless of where I am at. Mexico will always be here. I might come back and have tacos next time, but right now it doesn't line up with with my goals. So I'm going to do what I've set out to do and I'm going to be the best version of who God has called me to be um, because I understand that if I want to get to where I want to be, it's going to take time. I mean, it's going to take time being in the gym. It's going to take time for me, you know, being disciplined and consistent. I can get tacos in Los Angeles if I absolutely want them. And you guys might not understand or you might not even agree, but that's my mindset. And I share all of that because it's the same for the word, right? 
It's the same for the word. Life is always going to throw you obstacles. There's always going to be something there that if we allow it will become an excuse. So I'm gonna get up regardless of my time zone. I'm gonna get up regardless of what country I'm in. I'm gonna get up regardless of what's going on in my life and I'm going to run to the scripture. I want to spend time in the presence of God. I want to mature. A year from now, I want to take every uh, opportunity that I've had to know God more, to mature in his presence, to know the word more, to have the scripture written on my heart. I want to, when it comes time for me to account for the time that I had after I received Jesus, I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant because I've put in the time, the energy, the effort, and I've used my resources to know him more, right? I want to be, I, I want, to be satisfied. I want to get to a point where just like Paul says, where I've learned because I've spent time in the presence of God and in the word, I've allowed it to transform me, to change me. I've allowed the word to be written on my heart and I've allowed it to make me a new man and make me more like Jesus. So I get to a point in my life that I, I have learned to be satisfied with everything that I have, everything that I have. I'm not constantly looking for the next thing. I'm not constantly looking and striving for the next uh, belt or shoes or trip or, or wage or money. I'm not, that's not my God. That's not what I'm here for. I, I'm, I'm content with all of the things that I have. And I want to be content with everything that happens in the face of tragedy, in the face of tribulation, in the face of issue, in the face of obstacle. I understand that tragedy can strike my door at any moment. I'm fully aware of that. Uh, I think about it often, right? I have three kids who live in a different state. I'm, I, I, I do think and I am aware that there's some bad things that could potentially happen if I, you know, me not being there. But I've, I've established and found a position in my heart that regardless of what life throws at me, right? My, my mom's getting old, I think about that. I've got friends and family members who might not, uh, might not make it, who might not, um, you know, might not live to see another day. There's people who I might not be, uh, you know, in contact with, but I've gotten to a place in my life where I understand regardless of what happens, whatever bad news that I receive, regardless of any of those things, I know that I have Jesus. I've gotten to a place in my life where I know my relationship with Christ supersedes all of those things. And that it, although it's temporary and that it can be challenging and it can be hurtful and it can be hard, um, I believe that God has equipped me with everything that I need to overcome those obstacles. And he has given me something greater, greater than anything that this world can throw at me. I have eternal salvation, right? Because of a free gift, not because of anything that I've done. So for me, I can always find something to be joyful about. I can always find something to be thankful about. I have learned to be satisfied with all of the things that I have and that everything that happens. And I understand that joy is my choice. It is a position that I have created in my heart posture because of the amount of time that I've spent in the presence of the Lord. And I understand that regardless, regardless of, of, of what happens, He loves me. He's got me. He has a place for me. He's making a place for me. Man, Holy Spirit, thank you. It is truly a peace that surpasses our understanding. And it comes only from Him. It comes only from Him. Mm. Verse 12, you know, he's talking about, and this goes into one of the most quoted scripture, um, you know, for all my gym rats out there and we completely take it out of context because it has nothing to do with like physical strength but we love that as we're lifting weights philippians 4 19 i can do all yeah i can do all things through christ who strengthens me and we're lifting like a 500 pound deadlift and he's just like no bro that's not even or what is it 13 yeah philippians 4 13 i can do all things through christ who strengthens me it ain't even it's not even what it's about but let's get into it in verse 12 he says i know how to live when i'm poor and i know how to live when i have plenty I have learned the secret of being happy at any time in everything that happens. Wow. Listen to him. I have learned the secret of being happy at any time in everything. Any time in everything. Whether he's poor, whether he's rich, whether he has little, whether he has much, whether he has more than enough. Regardless of his, the, the state of his environment in the physical realm, he has learned the secret of being happy at all times, at all times. When I have enough to eat and when I go hungry, when I have more than I need and when I do not have enough, I can do all things through Christ because he gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
I think that we need to put this back into context, right? We put this back into context and this gives us peace, this truth, right? It's not about lifting a 500 pound deadlift, right? But we can do those things. Um, and I don't want to take away from that, but the context is, is you can be satisfied. You can have peace. You can have happiness. You can find joy in all things because of the strength that Christ gives you in the middle of whether you have enough, whether you don't have enough, whether you're poor or whether you're rich, regardless of what's going on your on in your life, you can overcome by the strength that is given to us by Jesus Christ. And that strength, that strength comes from a knowing, a knowing of where you're going when it's all said and done. It's not by my might, it's not by anything that I've done, it's not because of my good works, it's not because of how often I tithed or how many old, little old ladies I've walked across the street or cats I've saved out of burning houses and trees. It, it has nothing to do with any of that. I can overcome anything and everything that is brought to me in this physical life because of the strength of Christ, because of the truth of Christ, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, he paid the price for my sins so that I would not be eternally separated from God. And now I have this knowing. I know regardless of my feelings and my emotions, regardless of what's going on in this world, whatever's happening over here, whatever's happening over there, regardless of those things, the strength of Christ, because I know who he is and I know who I am, I can find a position of praise and be joyful and happy in the face of some of the most undescribable tragedies that will happen in your life. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. need 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 uh, this word pops out uh, it's it's in this verse alone and, and in this translation it says need probably seven times eight times in verse uh 16 he says i need uh, you know uh, several times you sent me things i needed when i was in thessalonica right in verse 18 it says i have all that i need because epaphroditus brought your gift to me he says in verse 19, my God will use his wonderful riches in Christ Jesus to give you everything you need, All right? Need, need, need. We, we typically have all that we need, but thoughts of anxiety, depression, frustration, discouragement, all of those, I believe that a lot of those emotions and feelings and those places that we go stem from us thinking that we don't have the things that we need right when we don't when we think that we don't have the things that we need but the absolute truth is that god gives you everything that you need it's a matter of perspective so what i've found is that if i don't have something i don't need it and many times many times the need is directing, is directing my steps. So if I'm constantly going this way, chasing after the things that I want and I'm constantly not getting them, many times I feel like God is leading me in a different direction. God has taken me in a different direction. He's taken me in a, in a different path. I'm following the need. God will supply all your needs, not your wants. He's not a genie. Many people think that he's a genie, that they can rub on the scripture and ask for whatever it is that they want, and they're going to get it. And if they don't get what they want, right, and they don't understand that they have everything that they need, they start to get frustrated and discouraged, and they start to question God. They start to think that he doesn't love them, or they think that he doesn't hear them, when that couldn't be further from the truth. It couldn't be further from the truth. It says that God will supply all your needs, all of your needs. And so for me... That's a great way to that's a great way to kind of gauge the direction that I'm going. I'm I'm constantly going in the direction of provision, right? The direction of provision. It's almost like for me, as I stay in tune with the spirit, again, this isn't scriptural, this is this is my personal experience. So please take this with a grain of salt. I think of like God leading the Israelites through the wilderness. And I almost think of the, the, the manna and the cloud and the water, uh, the rock that came 
that, that, that gave them water. That was the provision. And I feel like he was leading. It's almost like breadcrumb by breadcrumb. And he's putting provision out and leading in the direction that they needed to go. And for me, as I'm walking day to day, I'm looking and being in tune with the Spirit and seeing where God is providing. And the places that God provides, that's the direction that I go. Okay, the things that I need, I go in that direction. And I almost feel like he's leading me breadcrumb and breadcrumb and breadcrumb and he's leading me down this trail. He's not giving me too much. He's not giving me more than I can understand. He's not giving me more than I can comprehend. He's not giving me more than I can handle on my own. And if he does, then I find a place where I rely on him. It's becoming reliant on him and paying attention to the spirit. And right, it says that my sheep will know my voice. So some people might be like, well, what if the devil's putting provision? For no, no, no. He doesn't have that power. He doesn't have that authority in my life. I haven't given that to him. I stay so close to God that I am able to discern whether or not things are from him or things are from the enemy. All right? So that if, as you keep your eyes on Christ, as you stay close to your shepherd, right? As you're a sheep and you're being shepherded, as you stay close to him, the enemy isn't able to get close. He might come as a wolf in sheep's clothing and get try, you know, try to get near, but I understand that my shepherd has a rod in his hand and he strikes down the enemy and he keeps me safe, he protects me. And so, you know, I, as we keep our eyes on him and we follow the provision, we follow the breadcrumbs and we stay in tune with the spirit, he leads us in a direction uh, of where our needs are constantly being taken care of. Right? It's easy to get distracted and think that the things that we want are the things that we need. And many times that's what we do. We can be close to the shepherd and he's leading us in a direction. And then that wolf sneaks up in sheep's clothing and that could come in the form of a relationship. Right? How many of you guys have been whole and healthy and close to God and you're getting your, you're getting your body back because now you're eating right and you're sleeping right and now you're drinking a lot of water and you're reading your Bible and you're in prayer and you're doing all these things and then somebody comes up out of nowhere and shows you a little attention and next thing you know, you're flabbergasted because somebody's giving you a little bit, you know, giving you a little nod and a wink and you're completely sidetracked. God was leading you provision by provision by provision and keeping you, you know, getting you and molding you and shaping you into who he wants you to be. And you just, you go, oh, this must be from God. And so you go down this path and it turns out to be a complete waste of time, a complete distraction. And now you come, you know, limping back to God, not the same way that you went out and away because you were distracted, right? And that, that's not even just like relationships, you know? You, this can also be opportunities. If you're not paying attention to the Lord as he's leading you provision by provision, a big opportunity might pop up out of nowhere that it comes with a better 401k package and a better benefits package. And it might come with, you know, this, this great, this big shiny salary. And you're just like, that's what I want. And God's like, no, 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 I'm trying to take you this way. And what I have for you is better than that. That's a distraction. But we're so quick to jump at the first opportunity because now it's something different and shiny. And we go, this must be from God, but not every opportunity is from God. Not every relationship is from God. Not all, but many times these things are distractions and they're meant to pull you away from him because they come packaged as shiny and many times too good to be true, right? Because the devil's a liar. So he'll come in like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He'll disguise himself as an opportunity from God. And because we're not tuned in with what the shepherd's saying, because we're not spending time in his word and in his presence, because we're not seeking godly counsel, or maybe we are, but we're just not listening. We allow ourselves to be distracted and pulled and led astray, right? You, you get the idea of being led astray. You can't be astray from something you weren't with. So right, there's a place and a point where we're walking with our shepherd and to be led astray means that, you know, we saw something shiny. There was a distraction, something popped up and grabbed your attention. And it, it's the, the accuser of the brethren. It's the father of lies. You're allowing him to get close and you're not staying in tune with the Lord and you're finding yourself off on a tangent, pursuing the things that you want and not the things that you need. I believe that if we stay in tune with him, our needs will lead. Our, 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 the provision will lead us in the direction that we have to go. Um, that really does take discipline. And even as, even as Paul says, right, it's that spiritual maturity that I'm talking about. 
I said, I have, I have learned to be satisfied with the things I have and with everything that happens. It's a learning process. It wasn't something that happened overnight, right? But again, we are talking about uh, every day that we live is a new opportunity for us to be more like him, right? So when I first got saved, I was a spiritual baby. I, I couldn't palate spiritual food. I, I, I still had my wobbly little neck and my chubby little baby legs and I couldn't even stand up on them. And so as a baby brand new Christian, as I was born again, I, I'm currently going through the process of growing up. I'm going through the process of becoming better and stronger and newer and having a deeper, greater understanding. And it comes, it's directly correlated with the amount of time that I spend in the word and that I spend with him. The more I see him, the more I start to look like him. The more time I spend in his presence, the more I start to sound like him. The more that I, I'm incorporating him into my day and making it all about him, the more that I start to be like him. And so, yeah, man, it's, you know, it's, it's that process of daily dying to yourself, daily picking up your cross, daily choosing him. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the distance between where you are and where you want to be lies in your daily habits, right? That sounded really motivational speechy um, because it was, and that's something that I've heard, but it's so absolutely true, right? Where you are and where you want to be lie in your daily habits. So uh, I'll relate that to fitness. If you want to have the body that you desire, the body that you want, it comes with making sacrifices and it comes with daily sacrifices. You're not gonna be able to just eat whatever you want, drink however you want, uh, not exercise, not rest, not get enough sleep. You're not gonna be able to do those things. It comes with these daily habits. The same with your spiritual walk. You wanna be a spiritual monster. You wanna have spiritual muscle. You wanna overcome your flesh. You wanna walk on the head of the enemy. You wanna hear God's voice. You wanna discern the direction that he's taken you in your life. It comes from spending time and making a habit out of being in his presence, being in his word, being uh, you know, in a place of worship, constantly checking your heart posture, constantly checking your heart, reflection, repentance, pursuing holiness, pursuing righteousness pruning and auditing every aspect of your life on a daily basis. And the beautiful thing is that as you, as you make those attempts and as you head in that direction, God meets you there every time, every single time. It's just not easy, right? It's just not easy. And that's what people, and that's what people want to say and that's what they want to hear. They want me to sit here and co-sign that, oh yeah, it's not easy, so you know, just kind of sit in it and take your time. No, 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 I'm calling you guys higher, man. I'm calling you, I'm, I'm calling you, I'm calling you guys higher. <laughs> Why am I talking so softly? Because I'm in a public place. That's a good question. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just in a place that echoes. So the louder I speak, the more that it echoes. But I'm in this big hall, right? I'm in this big place. I'm actually sitting behind the concierge desk, so I just made myself at home. There's the concierge desk. So I'm in this big room that has this crazy echo, and so I'm speaking in a, a manner that's not too loud, um, because I also understand that there's people coming through here, and I'm not trying to be uh, super disruptive. Amen? So let's jump over. There's only a couple of things I wanted to share out of Proverbs chapter 16 today. Um, thank you, Lord. This is what it is. Oof, oof, oof. Verse 9. Verse 9 is one that I quote on a regular basis. 69. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. It's so powerful because, you know, that's... We can make all the plans, all the dreams, all the goals. We can have all the visions for our lives, but God truly knows best. And that kind of ties into exactly what we're talking about, being led by provision. My plans, the things that I've planned for my life, it wouldn't have me sitting here in Mexico with a passport for the very first time at 37 years old um, on a live preaching the gospel and loving on people at 5.30 in the morning. I could have never planned this. I could have never planned the life that I'm living now. I could have never planned meeting the woman who I'm married to. None of this was a part of my plan. Not any of it. I didn't sit down and say, this is exactly what I want to do. And I've got this five-year plan. My five-year plan looked a lot different. And if I followed my five-year plan, I'd probably be dead, if I'm being honest with you. Because the way that I was living was not good. I understand that there are things that my heart wants and desires that are not for me. 
I've come to a place where I realize that my life in my hands isn't a good thing because I'm constantly going after things that I think that I want, but I've found that I know that my Father knows best. My Heavenly Father created me. He knows exactly what I need. So therefore, I'm understanding that, look, my plans, it's okay for me to have plans. It's okay for me to have visions and dreams and goals, and I'm gonna go after them, but I'm gonna go after them in a manner where my eyes are on Him. And so I'm taking a step and I'm looking at Him. Is this the right way? Okay, I'm going confidently this way. Is this the right way? No? Okay, let me back up. I don't want to go that way. Like, okay, if that's not what you want for me, I don't want to go that way. Period, point blank. If it's not from you, I don't want it. So I'm living life in a manner where I'm taking a step of faith and I'm looking. Is this right? Okay, that's right. Awesome. I'm going to take another step of faith. I'm going to go in this direction. And I take another step. Is this right? And I'm looking to God. I'm not running too far ahead. I found a pace where I'm walking hand in hand. And if, if, if I hear or feel in the spirit that that's not what he wants me to do, where he doesn't want me to go that way, I take a step back and I draw near to him. Okay, I don't want to go that way. I've gone, I've done things my way. I've gone, gone down roads on my own. Lord, where do you want me to go? I'm here. Lead me, guide me, teach me, help me. I'm, I'm, I'm humble. I don't want to do things according to my flesh. I don't want to make plans and go my way. A man's heart divides his way, but the Lord directs his steps. I want to be directed. I don't know about you. I want to be directed. I want him to lead me and guide me victory by victory, day by day, breadcrumb by breadcrumb, provision by provision. And I want to be so in tune with him that I'm not forgetting about him or blocking him out. That's what many of us do as we go after the things that we want. It's kind of like we put God on the back burner and we go to him when we need help. Oh, God, help me get over this situation. Oh, God, help me get through this. Oh, Lord, I need you to change this person or change that situation. I need you to change this and change that and do this and do that. Uh-uh. Lord, change me, right? Change me. I'm the problem. I'm the issue. I'm the drama. <laughs> change this heart of mine. Make me more like Jesus. Jesus was so in tune with God, step by step, day by day, victory by victory. He relied on the strength and the power. He was in tune with him. Change me, change this little heart. And I believe that as you change me, the things I start to ask for change to direct my steps. Verse 18, verse 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. There's been this heavy emphasis on humility. I think this is for somebody. I know this is for somebody. I know that it's for me uh, as God constantly preaches humility uh, to me. The, 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 we, go to, we get to this place where we can allow pride in any aspect in our life and uh, just a constant reflecting on, hey, I need to check my heart. I need to make sure that there's no pride, there's no arrogance in these aspects and in these areas. And um, it spoke to me, it's better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And you just get this picture of, of, of somebody, you know, sitting with, with individuals who don't have much, but in a humble manner, instead of, you know, being at this big table with all of these proud individuals and dividing this big spoil, like, man, I, I want to sit with the humble. I want to sit with the humble. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, verse 24, verse 24, and these are all recurring themes. These are things that we've been talking about, man. Mm. I got to answer this. Okay. What if it scares you that you don't fulfill God's plan? Scare, being fearful is not from God. So what's happening, my friend, is that you have a relationship with the enemy. Um, is a familiar voice and you continuously because you know me and I, I, I message you I've, I've been in contact with you and this is good because I can get a chance to address you this is with truth and with love so I'm not coming down on you but you don't know who you are in Christ and this constant fear this constant being scared and this anxiousness and this worry you don't know who you are and what you've done is you've pulled a chair up to your table and you are allowing the enemy to sit there with you fear is not a fruit of the spirit God has not given us a spirit of fear, and the scripture tells us that. The scripture tells us over and over and over, do not worry. Don't be anxious. Stop overthinking. Have faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Does this make sense? We need to get to a place. You're in a place where you're allowing fear. God did not give us a spirit, a, a, a spirit of timidity 
We're not to be timid. We're not to be fearful. We're not to be filled with worry and anxiousness. And when you're allowing that, you're actually walking in disobedience because you're allowing the enemy to come in. You don't know who you are. And that's why every day we're showing up saying, hey, know who you are. Rebuke the enemy. Hey, the scripture, the truth says resist him and he will flee. But, but many of our resistance is like, get away. No, I don't want, no, uh-uh, no. And then he's just like, what kind of boldness and authority is that? That's weak. And he just presses in and you go, oh gosh, I'm just, I give up. I can't resist. I can't fight. Right? It's like, come on. Come on. Start resisting the devil like your life depends on it. Because the, 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 like, like what happens is that fear paralyzes you. We have this fear response, the fight, flight, or freeze. And, and this, is, this isn't even scriptural. Like this is just in life. If a bear is coming up to you and it's about to eat you, you have three responses, right? You're going to fight, you're going to flee, or you're going to freeze. And what most Christians are doing is they're freezing or they're fleeing. Understanding that we have the authority over the devil. We must fight Right? In Ephesians 6, it talks about spiritual warfare. God gives us armor to put on because it is a war. So many of us are frozen by fear, frozen by worry, frozen by concern, frozen by anxiousness, frozen by depression. So we stand there and we allow the enemy to roar and we allow him to boast. It's almost like uh, you know David and Goliath where Goliath is there and he's just running his mouth and people are scared to do anything. Right? Or, or, you know, in the face of a bear, as soon as you see the devil attack, you take off and you run. No, Christian, follower of Jesus, vessel for the Holy Spirit. The power in you is greater than the power in this world. David stood up to Goliath. He saw him and he's like, uh-uh, I have the power of God. I have God's favor. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how loud you are. I don't care how many other people are running and you're being scared. Uh-uh, let me throw this thing in the sling and wow, take him out. Like that's, that's, that, that's because you, you don't know who you are or the power that you possess. And so you walk around timidly, you walk around fearful, you walk around scared, concerned, you know, cowered over. And it's just like, oh, I don't want to make a mistake. God's going to be mad at me. I don't want to live in faith. I don't want to do anything wrong. I just, and that's being frozen. You, you, the enemy has rendered you useless. God can't use you in that state. When you're in this constant state of fear and worry and concern and questioning and overthinking, God can't use you because your mind's not even focused on him. You're just focused on the problem and it's got you scared and you're just, you're in mood, you're just, you're right there. And, and so, I mean, I can't really speak much more to it. We speak about this every single day with love and with truth. Be bold, know who you are. Know it's not as hard as you're making it. The, when you understand the authority that you have, the enemy has to respond, right? Here's truth, here's a lie. The fact that as I'm saying this, he's sitting there whispering lies to you as we speak. Oh, you're not strong enough. You can't do that. You're not bold enough. You don't have that courage right there. Listen, that familiar voice that's whispering negative things at you right now as I'm trying to encourage you in the Lord and I'm trying to give you the boldness and trying to unlock the authority that you have, even now the audacity that he has as he sits there and whispers to you, you're not strong enough. You can never have that boldness. You can't have the same fire as Andrew. You can't walk like that. But he doesn't understand what you're going through. He doesn't understand what's going on. Come on. Come on, man. Verse 24 says, pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Um, I really wanted to close with this. I'm not going to, but I wanted to encourage you guys um, today, make it a point to reach out to somebody and to share some words that are as sweet as a honeycomb. Maybe a little bit of encouragement, you know, send a message out to somebody, let them know that you were thinking about them. Uh, you never know who needs it. You never know who needs a prayer. You never know who, who needs just a pat on the back or a little bit of love. Um, don't reach out to me. I'm on vacation. It's my last day. Uh, so I don't need your honeycomb words today. Um, I'll take them on Sunday when, I went, when we're back in the Jeep. But, uh, you know, it's just encouragement. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb. We talk about how much power there are in words. And we use Philippians chapter 4, uh, you know, verse 8 in, to, to talk about those things. So I want to encourage you guys today to step out 
with a little bit of love, a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of inspiration. And I want you to, to reach out and spread that love, encourage somebody. He says, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasant words are as a honeycomb. That's like the sweetest sugar, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Mm, that's a good word. One of you guys are going to reach out to somebody today and it's going to be a matter of life and death. That's what the Spirit, that's what Holy Spirit put on my heart right now. Is that word is for somebody. And as you reach out to somebody today, um, you're going to find them in a place of despair. They thought nobody cared about them. They thought nobody thought about them. They thought nobody loved them. They thought nobody would care if they weren't here and are on the verge of doing something stupid. So with your obedience of reaching out, one day you'll hear the story, how your random text, your random message, your random you know, thought, because right now I believe Holy Spirit's putting somebody on your heart right now. I don't know who this is for, but I know in the Spirit, Holy Spirit's saying you, and that's who you need to. And right now it's coming to mind, it's coming to your heart. There's somebody who's on your heart and on your mind that you need to reach out to, and it's a matter of life and death. And your obedience is going to be a part of a testimony. Somebody's going to get up and give glory to God and testify that because of your timely word, because you reached out, oh, thank you, Jesus, because you reached out, you stopped them from doing something that is irreversible and forever changed the trajectory of their life. Glory to God. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So if that's you, be obedient, okay? There, there's something that's great in that obedience. Be obedient to that nudge and that leading from the Holy Spirit. And uh, yeah, thank you, Jesus. Wow. The last thing I want to close with is verse 32. And it says that um, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. So uh, it's just kind of a, it's a reminder it's a reminder to be slow to anger. Um, many times that's what we like to do is we like to rush to anger. We've talked about this over the last couple of days. We've talked about reacting versus responding. Right? Reacting versus responding. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he that rules his spirit than he that taketh the city. When you rule your spirit, right? He said marching band, did y'all hear that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I was just like, hmm, okay, okay. That's awesome. Uh, he that ruleth his spirit, that he that taketh the city. This spoke to me like on another level because the power to rule over, um, it's not necessarily like ruling over the Holy Spirit, but ruling over your life, not allowing the enemy to be, um, to have power and authority over the things that you're doing. <laughs> you guys are like lots of noise. I told you that's why I'm whispering. That's why I'm speaking in a certain manner. But owning your life, owning it. Um, we understand that God owns your life. We understand that he is the author and the creator and that he navigates and he leads and guides. We understand that, but uh, we do have free will and it's our choice. It is our choice. Um, Okay, the podcasts are really low. It's right here. It's right here on the thing. I'm, I'm, yeah. Uh, so yeah, just having that strength, having that power. Um, lost my train of thought. Glory to God. That means it's time to be complete. So let's say a prayer and uh, we'll get up out of here. And we'll be back tomorrow. It's going to be a little bit early tomorrow. Um, yeah tomorrow because I fly out at 5 a.m. So it's going to be a little bit earlier. So let's say a quick prayer. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. We just thank you for the love that only Jesus can provide. We thank you for being the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for your death, burial, and resurrection, God. We just thank you for any disruption, anything that's coming against uh, who you are, Lord, anything that uh, looks to pull our attention away from you. Help us to stand unashamed for, for your truth. Help us to stand in the, the face of opposition uh, for, for who you are. God, we are so grateful for you calling us your children, for you calling us home. 
regardless of our mistakes and our failures, of all the things that we've done, you know, we just thank you. We thank you for the, the power that we have within us. Lord, we ask that you would help us to walk in it, that we would start walking boldly in the authority uh, and the courage that you've given us. God, help us to start seeing ourselves as you see us. Lord, nothing's more important than living a life that brings glory and honor to your name and helping other people know about this free gift of salvation that comes only through Jesus. So God, help us to be lights in this world. Help us to be ambassadors of your son. And help us, Lord, um, help us just uh, be, be beacons of encouragement and inspiration, pointing people to the foot of the cross and shining light on uh, the, the free gift of salvation that is for everybody. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Um, wow. We've gone well over our time. I feel complete in the spirit. Um, today is the end of a chapter. And uh, I just want to ask, you know, for anybody out there, anybody out there who doesn't know Jesus, anybody out there who doesn't know um, Christ as their savior and wants to be saved this morning, uh, I just feel led right now to offer that an opportunity for you to, to put your faith in Jesus, to repent from your sins and to make him the savior of your soul, the Lord of your life. This is something that we do at the end of every chapter and I feel like there was so much distraction because um, somebody's life hinges on it and depends on it. And in my own frustration, I was ready to run off of here, but Holy Spirit says no. Somebody needs to be saved today. Somebody wants to put their faith in Jesus. And so if you're here, you're lingering, you're still on, and that's you, you're waiting for that opportunity, I wanna give you that opportunity. And if you guys gotta get out of here, I understand, but right now we're gonna save a soul. So if that's you and you wanna receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you wanna rededicate your life to him, I want you to put in the chat, I wanna be saved. If that's you, right now you're on the verge, you don't know if you died or where you would go, or what would happen if you're unsure of that? I want you to put in the chat, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to give you, I want to give you this opportunity. There's one. It was for you. We linger for you. Heaven rejoices in this moment. Heaven rejoices in this moment, Joseph. Adri. Steve Wolf, glory to God. Glory to God. Even in this place, man, even in this place, as people would, people, I understand if you got to go, you got to go. Rush out of here, that's fine. I understand. Um, we can't rush Holy Spirit. There was so much distraction, uh, and it was trying to dissuade us from that. And so, glory to God. I just want to give God praise right now, like in this place. Thank you, Jesus. God, I give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you, Lord. Um, wow. So if that's you and you want to be saved, I want you to pray this with me. Right? As God is our witness, the power of our words right now, I want you to say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I repent for my sin. And I want to invite you to be the Lord of my life and the Savior of my soul. I understand that my sin separates me from God. But I know that because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the payment for my sins have been paid in full. I invite the Holy Spirit to dwell in me as I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and that no one goes to the father except through him so right now i lay down my life i want to be saved and i put my faith in jesus in jesus name we pray amen and amen my friend, if that was you, if you just received Jesus Christ, I want you to know that he loves you, that he thinks about you, he knows you, and that you are forgiven. 15 people for Jesus? 
wow, 15 people for Jesus on a Friday? Glory to God, glory to God. An altar call we almost missed because of the distraction. An altar call we almost missed because of the enemy uh, trying to rush me out of here. An altar call we almost missed. Souls that might not have had an opportunity to receive salvation, glory to God, or to receive that word today. Thank you, Jesus. I don't care if I'm in public. I don't care if I'm in public. I don't care if I'm disrupting. God deserves glory. God receives glory. Thank you, Lord. If that was you and you received salvation today, I want you to go to my website. We've got some uh, free things for you uh, on our website, royalcitychurch.org. Um, it's resources for you who, who just got saved. And um, right now I am filled with so much gratitude, peace, and happiness. Um, I'm overwhelmed. I don't even know what to do with my hands. I know that you guys gotta go. And this is by far probably the longest episode we've had to date, uh, but glory to God. Look, I love you, I honor you guys. Yes, I was on early today. You guys, for those of you who are just tuning in, I've been in Mexico, I'm two hours ahead. And tomorrow, it'll be a very short and sweet coffee and prayer because I'm getting on a plane at five. I'm getting picked up at five, so I won't be able to do a full-fledged coffee and prayer. I'll be going live, my time, 4.30 a.m., and it will be a very brief, I'm not gonna miss the streak, I'm not gonna miss a day. Um, We'll be quick, we'll be short, we'll be sweet, but I'm gonna be flying out. So you guys will probably have to catch the replay because it's gonna be 4.30 my time, which will be on the West Coast. It's gonna be 2.30 a.m. I don't expect any of you guys to get up for a 30-minute coffee and prayer. Uh, so hope you guys have an amazing day. I'm doing my best with the resources I got. So podcast, it might be a little low for the next couple of days, but the quality will go back up when I'm back home in the Jeep. These are first world problems. I'm just thankful that I am where I am. You guys are, are, are where you're at. We're all together. I love you. I honor you. And I'll see you guys back here tomorrow. God bless you.